to remain in their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of the launch escape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or the LD, and they'll approve aborting the launch countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will board the launch ice sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the launch, the crew arm for movement. Proceeding with crew arm movement. All right, as you just heard there, that final go for launch as well as for propellant load coming from the launch director or LD. So all good news there. We are still go for space tonight. Uh, as of right now, the crew access arm is being prepared to be moved out of the way. Um, so to basically to clear room for the Falcon 9 to lift off. So uh, to follow along with that action live, let's go back crew over to- Crew access arm has started. And there's that call out for that retraction beginning. Let's go back over to Daryl to follow that live at KSC. All right, thank you, Kate. Appreciate it. The countdown continuing to tick down as you see the crew access arm moving away. I'm here with astronaut Raja Chari. That crew access arm, as it rotates out of the way, is that something that you can feel when it disconnects? So we talked about that. <laughs> we, we could definitely hear, uh, like, uh, thought we s the tense sense the vibration of it. Um, I think we got a little bit of sense of motion uh, from the wind, but uh, I don't know w if we were just imagining it <laughs> or <laughs> not. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot of your senses are super per like heightened, uh, heightened yeah. right now, yeah. Um, so you're definitely, uh, uh, we do we actually did talk through, I do remember talking to them, as we talked earlier about how you're kind of going through different scenarios and timelines and uh, one thing is if there is a emergency egress button in the capsule but one of the things the big difference is now that the arm is swung back is you definitely want to make sure the arm has swung back towards you in the event of an egress that makes mm -hmm. sense because you don't want to step out into no. <laughs> nothing because at this point the the les is not hot but the arm so has the arm would away. have to the come arm back. Has to swing back ah. yes and it, and there's two rates so the arm moves away at a slow rate but in the event of an emergency egress it swings back at a pretty quick rate right ah. so as you want to get out quickly yeah. um, but that's one of the things they're probably talking through is like hey don't forget first person out the door make sure to look down first <laughs> make sure there's <laughs> that's a that's important that's a, that's a big first step <laughs> yeah. if, if you no. if it has to swung back into place great insight there raja on the crew access arm i didn't know that about it being able to return so quickly but it makes great sense from a safety perspective. And so now, coming up, we expect to hear a call to arm the launch escape system. Yep, and so the crew at this point, uh, in preparation for that, will be putting the visors down. We, they should have already d done all those steps. Um, they'll verify that, and uh, once they get the go, then they will arm the LES and get confirmation uh, that it is armed. We talked before about uh, the hatch closed state, so that's uh, also in this phase. That's the way you actually know it's armed is you see the flight computer state change. So it's a, a command you send to put it into the armed state, and then you know what's happened when you'll hear sounds, but that's the, uh, that's the official way you know it's actually there. And the, the, really the purpose of the, the LES, of the launch escape system, is, is it's both an automated and a manual system. So there's the, the vehicle is monitoring a whole bunch of parameters, and so one of the reasons they have to do a poll for arming is all the operators on the ground are checking that there's no parameter out of limits that would trigger an escape inadvertently. So you don't want to turn on the system only to have it immediately uh, fire the capsule off. So the first thing they're doing is making sure every, all the parameters are stable, the telemetry is good, um, there's no noisy signals in the data that would inadvertently trigger it, uh, and then you'll then you arm the system. And then once it's armed, there's the automated abort, and then there's also a manual abort. So um, I don't know that you can see it in the camera views we have, but there's a handle that sits between Woody and uh, Steve that you can reach, you rotate and pull, that will manually initiate an abort. Um, and so just very similar to an injection seat where you pull Correct. the handle. Correct, the retraction complete. I mean, that's a big responsibility for the commander and pilot if you had to pull that handle. I mean, that's a... 
you don't want to do that unless you're right. absolutely and certain exactly. you got to get out of there. Exactly, and so there's a, the few cases, or if uh, that's why earlier they did all those checks on the, uh, the loops to make sure that the people on the ground that have the insight to the status of the F9 and the Dragon have the ability to talk to the crew. So if there's a failure of the automated system that someone could tell the crew to manually initiate, or there might be some scenarios where the crew may notice something first um, and, and manually initiate. In just a few seconds, we're going to hear Dragon to Ground and that announcement for Go for Section Section 7. And Dragon, uh, SpaceX, you are Go for Section 6. Close visors and arm launch escape system. Okay, Section 6. Ready. All right, Section 6 is in work. I think it used to be 7, though. It is, yeah. So uh, which it's a great sign that they're constantly, like we talked about before. SpaceX Dragon, visors are closed. Constantly learning and making changes to procedures. Right. Earlier tonight, we saw a lot of work happening in parallel for the first time. So we had a lot of margin left over. And there you can see the white room exposed to the elements outside. Uh, SpaceX uh, Dragon arming and launch escape system. Okay, so that's uh, Steve telling them that they're SpaceX copies. initiating the command, like we mentioned. They'll do it. Actually, you can hear this. You can definitely hear this uh, and feel it in the vehicle. There's some uh, valves that are opening that are to the Super Dracos, which are the engines that would fire to initiate an abort, and those valves are safed until this point. So this command is essentially unsafing those valves, and you can very, very definitely hear and feel that inside the capsule. Those Super Draco engines you mentioned, Raja, capable of moving Dragon half a mile in just 7.5 seconds, equivalent to a peak velocity of 436 miles per hour. Such a tremendous focus on safety Watch because the astronaut lives armed. are in the hands of SpaceX and they want to get them out of there as fast as possible yeah, if it, there were to be an it's abort. It's an impressive system. Um, so actually we did a flight test of the, the abort system before Demo 2 and that was, that was impressive to see that thing work. And yeah, just a strong testament. I think one of the key things of the commercial crew program of having launch abort systems on both the Starliner and the Dragon, just a testament to how much we've learned over the years of space flight and, and the try to make it as safe as we can going forward. You heard the call from uh, SpaceX confirming that the the launch escape system is armed, so the next big thing now that it's armed, now it is safe to start loading prop once they get the go for that. If there were a pad abort, it would take the Dragon capsule two and a half miles east of pad A into the Atlantic Ocean. Dragon would come down under its parachutes land in the ocean. It could take about four hours to remove the crew. We have uh, assets with the Air Force called Detachment 3. Yep, Det 3 is what they call it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so there's uh, what's called uh, PJs or pararescue jumpers. Um, so we use a myriad of assets. Uh, the Air Force and Navy help support these launches uh, on both coasts. Um, and uh, basically the C-17, C-130s, helicopters, PJs, uh, it's quite a, quite a group, and all the more reason we have to look at that whole weather and a port corridor to have that ready uh, if, we need, if we need help. Yeah, because if they landed in the Atlantic Ocean, it would take, them, take some time to get there. We've got assets along the eastern seaboard. could take about six to eight hours, so you want those seas to be calm exactly. and not bobbing around in the ocean for that long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, we're yeah. getting ready to get that propellant load started. And once they start that load, you'll see they're making calls uh, for different phases of load, like the locks, the helium, different things. And the reason they're doing that is, again, you can hear that and feel it inside the vehicle as different valves open and close. Um, you can hear uh, hear the sounds of fluid flowing, hear, feel some different vibrations. Uh, and so that's why they're calling those that so the crew isn't aware of uh, if something's nominal or off nominal. If you hear a sound without a call, that could make you worry. So that way you know, like, okay, that's the one that we expected to, you know, that valve was supposed to open or supposed to close. Mm. Propellant load has started. Okay, and there we have the call that propellant load has begun. A big milestone as we count down to liftoff. Now T minus 34 minutes and counting. 
Today we'll begin the next six-month rotation mission to the International Space Station. The launch escape system is armed, which happened just before we began the loading the propellant onto Falcon 9. Meanwhile, the Dragon capsule was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road at a facility SpaceX calls Dragonland. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. For the fuel, SpaceX uses monomethyl hydrogen, or MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for oxidizer. And together, these propellants feed those Draco engines that maneuver Dragon, Dragon rather, on orbit as well as the eight Super Draco engines that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And again, now that the fueling for Falcon 9 has started, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule away from the Falcon 9 rocket in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. Of course, NASA and SpaceX trains extensively for exactly that type of contingency. So now let's head over to SpaceX commentator Kate Tice at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for an operations update. Kate. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, exactly right. We're continuing to count down the final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon, with the teams reporting no major issues at this time. Uh, now, with the launch escape system armed and Falcon 9 propellant loading underway, we are heading for an on-time launch just under 33 minutes from now. As we saw earlier, or rather heard, Falcon 9 propellant load began at T minus 35 minutes. Daryl did a great job of explaining uh, the propellants on Dragon. Let's talk a little bit about the propellants on Falcon 9, slightly different. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is fuel, loaded, loaded into a tank at the bottom of the stage. The other, an oxidizer, loaded into a tank at the top of the stage. The fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene, referred to as RP-1 or Rocket Propellant 1. The oxidizer loaded on each stage is a densified liquid oxygen, or LOX, densified meaning that it's kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles, therefore it takes up less volume, which allows for us to put more of that oxidizer into the first and second stages. To ignite the fuel and the oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use the ignition fluids of triethyl aluminum and triethyl boron, also called T-TUB. Now, when T-TEB comes into contact with oxygen, it burns, giving off a green-colored flame. Once we have the flame going, we add a little bit of that kerosene fuel into the Merlin chamber, and the engine ramps up to full power. Now, actually, you might see that green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation. Now, topping off helium into pressure vessels on both stages also underway. This is used to pressurize the tanks in flight as propellant is pulled out by the Merlin turbo pumps. You can think of this uh, similar to when you're drinking out of a plastic water bottle. You have to put some air back into the bottle in order to keep it from crumpling. So that's exactly what we're doing with that helium. On board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring the systems while propellants are loaded into the Falcon 9 below them. The crew's training in the simulator here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, actually includes playback of sounds recorded in Dragon capsules during recent flights. So uh, even though today is the first day they're hearing it live, they are prepared for these new sounds. Now the range continues to report no problems. Stage one cryohelium loading has started. They are go to support launch. Weather also continues to look great. Currently winds from the west-southwest at nine miles per hour, great conditions. We only have a 5% probability of violation for those constraints, so all in all looking good. As I mentioned earlier today, we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we'll have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity, which is tomorrow, just under 24 hours from tonight's planned launch. Now at T minus 30 minutes and six seconds, let's turn it over to Jesse and Gary for an overview of events that we'll see after liftoff. Thanks, Kate. For crew six, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 25 hours. 
Now, as we wait for that T0 mark in just under 30 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure that both the Dragon and the Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. Now, as we wait for that launch clock to hit zero, we wanted to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of the mission is going to look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit max Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Now, once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing, as a second stage continues its journey with the third event, SES-1, or second stage engine start number one, where the MVAC engine lights up and propel propels the second stage, along with our Crew-6 astronauts, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down to Earth. The first is the entry burn. That's where three of the M1D engines will reignite and then shut down again. This helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And while that first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for a confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, but it's powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. While Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it'll begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from that second stage. It's worth noting that these are not the Super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over the next 25 hours, Dragon will be on its approach and rendezvous phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way to the station. And all of that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Courtney in Mission Control Houston. Courtney. Thanks, Gary. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, ensuring it is ready to receive Crew Dragon. They're also making sure all communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly. The consensus to this point is that everything is proceeding right on track. The team here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft tomorrow. They'll perform a series of leak checks then work to open the hatches on both the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. And once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for welcoming remarks for the new crew members. From there on out, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 6, but rather as flight engineers of the International Space Station until their return back to Earth. Here in Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Chris Dobbins is on console overseeing the team for launch. And that'll do it from here in Mission Control Houston, so I'll toss it back over to our team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? Thank you very much, Courtney, and we're out here at the Kennedy Space Center. Folks are gathering on the lawn now, getting ready for this launch, and it's a beautiful sight behind yep. us, Roger. It's looking pretty good. Uh, 
It's a great view and looking forward to seeing my first launch and <laughs> watching another turtle go to space. Yeah, we're going to watch the launch and huh? we're going to watch you. <laughs> <laughs> see, see your reaction. Well, if you're just joining us, we are T-minus 24 minutes and counting now until the sixth astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. Commander Stephen Bowen, pilot Woody Hoberg, and mission specialist Sultan al Niyadi and Andrei Fedyev are strapped into their seats inside Dragon Endeavor. Uh, they're in that capsule right there as the Falcon 9 rocket fueling operation is well underway. The launch escape system is armed, and that means Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations look and sound as expected. Counting down to that liftoff at 1.45 and 3 seconds a.m. Eastern Time. Yep, and we heard uh, the call from the core that the Stage 2 cryohelium load had started, and like they described out at Hawthorne, so far what we've loaded is the gas to pressurize the tanks uh, around uh, probably about three-ish minutes from now we'll actually start the gas itself so like they're describing we need what you need you need uh, pressure to move the gas and then you need the actual gas in the locks itself so um, right now we're we are loading or they are loading that helium that pressurizes the tanks and then the next thing will be the the fuel and then the oxidizer those inert gases key to pressurizing those especially the locks this mission is the continuation of rotational crew flights to the International Space Station from U.S. soil on private rockets and spacecraft, and it would have been possible without the success of, of course, NASA SpaceX Demo 2, that test flight, now two, two and a half years ago. Of course, it was the safe delivery and return of crews one and two that got the operational flights rolling. There you can see inside the Dragon. You can see there. Oh. Visors are down and will stay down now since the uh, LES is armed. And you can see they're also not riding or doing anything more at this point <coughs> with, with the LES arm armed. Uh, you just have to wait uh, until they're done with that, the prop loading. Yep. And you can see now evidence that that liquid oxygen is flowing into that first stage as it super chills the outer skin of the rocket. And it, then it, um, you know, condenses the... Florida humid air <laughs> yeah. into a little bit of a cloud there. Talking about the crew inside, the commander of Crew 6 is Captain Stephen Bowen. He hails from Cohasset, Massachusetts. He's married with three children. He holds the title of first U.S. Navy submarine officer to be selected as a mission specialist by NASA. Captain Bowen is also a veteran of NASA space flights, including space shuttle flights on STS-126, 132, and 133. And uh, Steve's a veteran spacewalker and just a great veteran to have the off around the office uh, and great uh, commander to have for, for three rookies. Um, he's just, uh, and I think what we've learned about submarines is they're a lot like a space station. Uh, Kayla, who's also a submarine, are, uh, likes to say that both things are you know putting people where people aren't meant to be and a lot of the systems uh, and ways you have to work together are very similar. And you need good people working together in those tight quarters. Sitting next to Steven is pilot Warren Woody Hoberg. The 37-year-old is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He studied aeronautics and astronautics from MIT before getting a doctorate in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. During grad school, Hoberg worked as an EMT with the Yosemite Search and Rescue. I've seen pictures of him on a rope uh, <laughs> scaling <laughs> Half Dome. Crew 6 will be Hoberg's first flight since NASA selected him to be an astronaut in 2017. He is one sharp fellow, but also a great guy. Yeah, and also a turtle, so <laughs> proud to see him <laughs> going up there uh, as yet another member of our, uh, and, and super excited. Woody, like you said, just amazingly brilliant, uh, but also just so operationally sound. Uh, you know, his time working as a, basically rescuing people from ridiculous places. Right. I mean, uh, we're not talking run of the mill, like, you know, no. off a ski slope. We're talking like off of rock faces and cliffs and just some, yeah, crazy stuff and doing that and carrying someone else with you who's injured right. is not is no joke high risk rescues and it's uh incredible what he's been able to accomplish before becoming an astronaut in the role of mission specialist is astronaut sultan al niyadi stage two rp1 load complete okay we heard the rp1 complete in the stage two stage one will continue going all the way down to around t minus six minutes back to sultan 
He was chosen by the Mohammed bin Rashid, Rashid Space Center of the United Arab Emirates to be part of Expeditions 68-69. The father of five spent most of his life in Al Ain and Abu Dhabi. But in 2020, he traded it all in for astronaut training in Houston at NASA's Johnson Space Center. And this will be his first trip to space. Yeah, and so important uh, to have our UAE partners with us, uh, the first long duration UAE flight. So what a historic moment for UAE and for NASA to be working in partnership with them. Uh, like you heard uh, Hazad mention earlier, Sultan and him had trained together at Roscosmos, now trained together here. And it's uh, cool to see Sultan now going up there uh, on a U.S. commercial rocket to go to the, to go to the space station. And now we just heard the call. The strong back chill has begun. And you can see the condensing of the outside air, that super chilled liquid oxygen, both chilling the rocket and of course, the venting of that LOX going out into the air. Our next mission specialist, Andrei Fedyev. It's also his first trip to space for the second mission specialist. He's a Roscosmos cosmonaut, and he will be working to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and re-entry phases of flight. He will be a flight engineer for Expedition 68. And yeah, considering the partnership uh, with cosmonauts riding on uh, Dragons and uh, U.S. astronauts riding on Soyuz, so uh, great to see that continuing, and Andre, the latest uh, cosmonaut heading up on a Dragon. And happy birthday to him, yeah. he turns 42. Well, what a way to celebrate. Each of these four crew members will be part of the Expedition 68 once they arrive at the uh, International Space Station. At this moment, Raja, what's the crew feeling? I think it's uh, hoping that everything continues. Uh, you've trained so long for this. Um, you obviously w don't want to get what's called go fever, you know, when meaning you're going to ignore a problem, but you're just uh, kind of just hoping that there's not any problems that pop up at this point. And most of it's honestly out of your control, So, you're, but uh, you have complete trust in the team. Um, this is uh, where, you know, the reason we've trained so long and trained with the, these actual operators, the same people who are in the loops, is uh, if there are any issues, you can hear it in their voices. You've, you've worked with them, you know them. Um, complete confidence in the, the JSC and, uh, and MCCX, the Hawthorne teams, and just actually looking to, looking forward to actually getting to execute what you've trained so long to do. It makes sense. So much work and so much effort over the years has gone in to get to this point. You want to keep going. Yep. Yeah, and it's uh, and I think right now, just the final, my guess is what they're trying talking through is, so again, on those displays, uh, they're probably looking forward to a few events and talking through those. And so specifically, they are probably talking through the different launch abort phases. So you'll hear, once they actually ta lift off, you'll hear Stephen calling 1A, 1B, 2A. Those are the different launch abort stages. And what they're probably talking through right now is the timing of that, what things they're looking for on the displays, and just again, re- you know, sort of rehearsing as much as you can, because once it happens, it, it happens really quick. Um, so you're just kind of running through things over and over again. Um, the other thing there. Start of stage two locks load. All right. So, so there's the start of the locks being loaded on stage two. You heard the call there, so things still progressing well. And so the crew has a, a timeline of these events. So they're also, that's another way they can kind of QC if things are proceeding, maybe it's, if the fuel is taking longer or slower to slow, so they're kind of comparing what where they're sitting on the clock versus those calls and gives them a sense of how things are going. But there's no immediate direct telemetry in the Dragon capsule that tells you all the subsystems in the F-9 rocket. You're relying on the timing and some cues and listening to these calls to know what's going on with the rocket itself. Once it launches, you have telemetry on the F-9 engines, the status of the throttling command. So he talked about uh, out at Hawthorne, the max Q event and the throttle down. You can see that, you can feel it. Um, and actually that was probably what I thought uh, as one of the coolest things about our launch was that uh, I f we could feel and hear the throttle down before we saw it in the telemetry. So for all the automation and all the coolness of electronics, I thought it was amazing and very <laughs> awesome that the person is still <laughs> could still beat the machine. How about um, that? But uh, so that's kind of what they're, since they don't have that insight to the F-9 rocket, they're relying on the calls and the timing uh, as they are sitting here now and uh, just making sure everything's on track. Critical communications to the astronauts so they know exactly what's going on, as Raja mentioned. If you're outside and getting ready to watch this launch, you can hear it on the radio. 
It'll be available on local amateur VHF radio frequency 146.940 megahertz and on the UHF radio frequency 444.925 megahertz FM mode heard within Brevard County on the Space Coast. So the next thing uh, you should be, as we get closer to 10 minutes, they're going to make sure the launch displays are set up. And the reason they're going to do that is because once the launch happens, uh, you have the ability to, the, all the displays are touch screen, so you can change them and move them, but you don't want to be doing that during launch. And so there's a check in there to make sure you have all the views you want. Um, generally, what I'm guessing they'll do is they'll scroll on the procedure to where they expect to, uh, to so they don't have to scroll while they're you know, under G's. Um, they'll make sure that the mission specialists have the views that they need. You can see Andre is actually reaching up there right now. So they'll uh, kind of check to make sure that their line of sight is not obstructed. Um, and that uh, one more check of probably the volume control of their seats, that everyone can hear each other. Um, maybe give it a few clicks to account for the fact that it's going to get a little louder after launch. All right, let's get another update from uh, SpaceX and uh, check in with Kate Tice. Thanks, Daryl. We are T minus 13 minutes and 47 seconds from launch. Everything's still looking good for tonight's Falcon 9 launch for Dragon Crew 6. If you've been following along, you know that Falcon 9 began propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Loading of the RP-1 fuel on the second stage is complete. That finished around T minus 20 minutes. Fuel loading on the first stage continues. It's approximately 75% full and will finish around T minus six minutes. Densified liquid oxygen loading is underway on both the first and second stages. Uh, they are looking about 80% full on the first stage and just under 10% on the second stage. That will wrap up at T minus three minutes and T minus two minutes respectively. Checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, what we call TVC wiggles, those are coming up. That's basically when we use those thrust vector controllers to slightly move each engine nozzle. That's what allows Falcon 9 to steer itself during ascent. Dragon mission director and team reporting no major issues at this time. Communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted, as you can see there on your screen. It's nowhere in sight. The crew access arm, uh, excuse me, the launch escape system is armed and the crew is strapped into their seats and ready to go to space. Final instructions to the crew will come at T minus 10 minutes. The crew displays will be configured for launch. That setup gives the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant updates on vehicle health. You can see the crew there on the right hand side of your screen now looking pretty comfortable. At T minus five minutes, we'll be in terminal count and Dragon will then transition to internal power. We'll hear continued call outs on the countdown net as we continue to get closer to liftoff. As for the range, they remain green for launch, ready to go. Weather also still looking really good. Winds down to four miles per hour coming from the west. Um, only a 5% chance of violation for the criteria. So uh, continues to look good. I'm sure if it was daylight, it would probably be a cloudless sky for the most part there at Kennedy Space Center. So with that in mind, let's go back to Daryl at Kennedy as we continue to approach liftoff just under 11 and a half minutes from now. All right, good call outs there, Kate. Appreciate that. Some final thoughts from the commander of Crew 3 before we watch Crew 6 lift yeah, off. It's a, it's a great time to be here. You'll, you'll hear them in a few minutes. Uh, when they make the 10 minute call and confirm their displays are ready, uh, the crew will probably give a message thanking folks and just uh, the thoughts on their mind. There's a lot of work and a lot of people that have worked a long time to get them here. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty special moment. And when uh, they lift off, they'll be 260 miles over southwest of New Zealand. And with that, we want to focus on the pad now as we proceed through the final stretch of the countdown. We'll turn it over to Gary and Kate at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California to take us through launch and ascent. Thanks, Daryl. The energy is certainly starting to grow as we get closer and closer to T0. As you can see the vehicle there at pad 39A, that's Falcon 9 with the Dragon capsule positioned on top. Now we're gonna go through a couple of things, including some physical changes to the pad, um, but you will likely hear a number of callouts um, after liftoff uh, that are basically indicative of the various abort modes um, that Dragon passed through during flight.
Now T minus 10 minutes. Dragon, SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. Uh, SpaceX Dragon crew displays are configured for launch. All SpaceX right. copies. On behalf of our entire team at SpaceX, we're honored to we are honored to have you aboard Dragon Capsule Endeavor today for its next trip to the International Space Station. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. And thank you very much for those kind words. We'd like to thank all the trainers, technicians, engineers, decision makers, and planners who have uh, defined our mission ahead and trained us and then given the faith in us to execute that mission. And Crew 6 is ready to launch. And those words coming from the crew, crew six inside the Dragon right now under nine minutes from launch. Those final instructions meaning we are in terminal count. Falcon 9 launch commit criteria is getting checked by the computers. And we're in the final stretch here inside 10 minutes until liftoff. Kate was mentioning a series of uh, number and letter combinations that you'll hear upon ascent once we get to that point. That'll be those uh, abort, different abort modes that we'll be tracking throughout the ascent. There's an alpha and, and bravo on the first stage, and there's 2A through 2E on the second stage uh, as we track it up the eastern seaboard. Right now coming up on T minus eight minutes, the next major milestone that we'll be hearing uh, will be about the uh, engine chill. That's right. That's a um, important step of the countdown. That's basically when at T minus seven minutes, uh, we will uh, open the pre valves of the engines to allow a little bit of the super chilled liquid oxygen into the Merlin turbo pumps. Uh, prior to the full flow of locks that occurs during ignition. Now, that's important because at this point in time, um, all the hardware is at ambient temperature. So by f opening the pre-valves and flowing a little bit of that super chilled, uh, densified liquid oxygen helps um, prepare the hardware for that colder temperature when the full flow of locks occurs. We should hear that call out in about 10 seconds. Engine chill. And there's that call out indicating that those pre valves have been opened, and now there's a little bit of that super chilled liquid oxygen flowing through the hardware, uh, basically chilling it out uh, on prior to liftoff. That's right. In the meantime, we're tracking fuel on the vehicle. Stage two RP1, or the fuel on the second stage, is complete. It's one of the earlier tanks to be completely filled in the countdown. But as we ch are, uh, continue to track the fuel loading, the next thing uh, will be the stage one, stage one RP, RP load. load complete. That's coming up here in about 15 seconds. Later in the countdown, we'll be tracking the um, tanks of oxidizer being completely filled. That RP-1 load is now complete on the first stage. So at this point in time, all RP-1 is now on Falcon 9, both for the first and second stages. Locks load continues, wrapping up at about T minus three minutes for first stage and T minus two minutes for the second stage. Coming up, we'll hear the call for Dragon to... Dragon, SpaceX, for awareness, we are seeing a T-TEB load issue and are troubleshooting. We are currently still go, but have further evaluation before making a final decision. We'll get you a final read before T-0. And SpaceX, Dragon, guys. 
That call out there just communicating to the crew that the launch teams are troubleshooting uh, a small issue with TTEB and uh, they will have some more information uh, for the crew in the next couple of minutes. That TTEB, as I mentioned earlier. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. And there's that call. Tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. A lot of information coming through right now just indicating that uh, that Dragon is now on internal power um, and now we are basically preparing to retract the strong back, which is the white structure there to the right of the rocket. We will see the clamps open just under those clamps just under the Dragon trunk. Those will begin to open and the strong back will retract away from the vehicle. Yeah, that's right. We'll see those clamps on the top of the structure there, just under the Dragon's trunk, which you can identify by the black uh, solar panels on the left of the base of the capsule itself and to the right. Uh, and then the structure itself will lean about two degrees, uh, and then it will retract the rest of the way once Dragon actually hits that T0 mark and lifts off. We're seeing those clamps being undone now. The two degree lean will be very subtle. And then you'll see it more when we hit that T zero mark. That's right. At liftoff, Falcon 9 will, or excuse me, the TE will actually um, retract to 45 degrees to clear the way for Falcon 9. That TE is basically what uh, attaches, has the umbilicals that attach to the vehicle that provide power, telemetry, and fluids prior to liftoff. Now, coming up in 10 seconds, we'll be listening for a call on stage one liquid oxygen load being complete. Dragon is in terminal count and on internal power. Minus two minutes, this 30 is the seconds. This LD on countdown one. Hold, hold, hold. We are sending down due to a T-tab ground issue. As you just heard, we have. Support has started. As you just heard, we have a hold tonight uh, due to the TTEB issue that I mentioned prior, and the. Dragon SpaceX with that call from LD, you are go to step into five decimal one hundred launch scrub. Five decimal one hundred launch scrub. That's in work. As with everything else, we are prepared for all scenarios, including, unfortunately, as we've seen tonight, a scrub. So the teams are now stepping into those procedures. That's right. Again, it was uh, the teams were tracking an, a ground issue with TTEB. That's the ignition fluid uh, that actually uh, sparks with the oxidizer and allows the engines to uh, fire. The teams were tracking this issue. And so we're in a nominal scrub configuration. We'll start to see sort of the, a sequence of uh, reversing some of the milestones we've been tracking as part of this countdown until the uh, crew axis arm swings back to the side hatch. And so the, hatch will, the crew can egress the vehicle as part of a nominal launch scrub. So for those of you just joining at about just just under two T, T minus two and a half minutes, we unfortunately had a scrub due to a T-TEB issue uh, with the ground systems. 
So as Gary mentioned, we are in a nominal scrub configuration. There we have our procedures now being enacted to uh, basically reverse all the progress that we made this evening, including propellant offload and bringing that crew access arm back into position and getting the astronauts out. Up until that point, everything was looking good. The uh, ground team had reported a, that issue. Uh, I believe it, it was around T minus five minutes. At this point in time, the launch escape system is still armed. But the crew continuing to look comfortable there inside Dragon Endeavor. And Dragon, LD on countdown one. At this time, our offloads are underway. Vehicle is safe and proceeding nominally with offload. Expecting about a 50 minute offload. Six Dragon copies about a five zero minute offload. And we'll be sitting here waiting. Thanks. So it will be a very methodical process to offload the Falcon 9 with the propellant and oxidizer. You can still, you can see some of that uh, some of that oxygen billowing off still. That'll be part of the sequence. They've also re-enabled auxiliary power to um, by umbilical to the Dragon as they uh, work their way through the nominal scrub timeline. Again, that's a 50 minute offload. For those again that are joining, we are in a scrub situation just under two minutes and 30 seconds from launch. Teams declared a scrub due to tracking a, a uh, ground issue with uh, TTEB. This is the ignition fluid uh, that's used uh, for the first and second stages that ignites the oxidizer for uh, igniting the engines themselves to lift Dragon uh, and into space. They were tracking this issue and declared a scrub again at the two minute 30 second mark. So we're going through a nominal uh, scrub uh, with a 50 minute fuel offload you can see the strong back clamps have been re-enabled in this view right here. After we offload prop, we'll see the crew access arm swing back to get the crew out. In the meantime, the launch escape system, uh, which is, uh, enables the Super Dracos to fire should there be any anomaly with the uh, Falcon 9 during the offload procedure. The, the crew does they have the ability to, to perform a pad abort. Right now, uh, the ground teams are tracking no issues. Everything going according to plan uh, for a nominal scrub. All right, for those who are just joining, as a reminder, we are in a uh, scrub. At a, just under two minutes, 30 seconds from launch, uh, the ground teams declared a scrub as they were tracking a uh, ground issue with the TTEB ignition fluid. And as a precaution, made a scrub for today's launch as we were counting down to T0. Now we're working our way through nominal um, scrub uh, procedures, which include offloading the 
fuel and oxidizer that are loaded on the Falcon 9 right now. Uh, you can see we made our way through the countdown to a strong back retract that has been put back into place and the clamps uh, just under the trunk of Dragon are now uh, in uh, their configuration that they were prior to uh, that part of the countdown. And Kate, we're making our way through offloading that uh, Falcon 9. That's right. In total, that prop offload is expected to take 50 minutes, 5-0. So unfortunately, at this point in time, there's not a whole lot that the crew there can do except patiently wait. I could imagine that they might be a little sad as of um, because the, otherwise they, they would be in space at this point, <laughs> effectively. Mm -hmm. um, but it, right now, they, as you can see, they are just sitting back and relaxing um, as the Falcon 9 teams on the ground continue to keep them updated. Um, as Gary said, this is a nominal scrub uh, procedure uh, or configuration. We have procedures listing out every step of this. So right now we are basically unfueling Falcon 9 from both the first and second stages uh, as Falcon 9 was nearly fully loaded at the time of the scrub. So as this continues, we will see some puffs of white clouds like you just saw there live um, as that detanking effectively is underway. Um, we will also see the crew access arm uh, go back into the service position. Uh, that will enable the uh, basically the pad team to re-enter the pad, go back up, and help the four astronauts that are currently there in the capsule um, basically unbuckle and 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 um, get out of the capsule and make their way back down to the ground. And it is going to be a methodical process, like you said, Kate. The uh... Uh, through the fueling that began at T minus 35 minutes, we made our way uh, quite a bit through the timeline and those tanks were pretty full. So the ground teams estimated a 50 minute, five zero minute offload of that fuel. In the meantime, the crew six astronauts are in a passive state. They'll be tracking the fuel offloading process and listening to the communications from the ground teams, giving them status updates along the way. Uh, but we are in a nominal configuration. In the meantime, they've taken the uh, Dragon Falcon 9 off of internal power and re-enabled auxiliary power back into the vehicle uh, as they continue to go through this process. And like you said, Kate, it'll be, uh, it'll be a little bit, and then we'll see that crew access arm swing back, uh, and they'll re-access the side hatch. If you were following along on our coverage, uh, they walk down the crew access arm and enter the Dragon through that side hatch. They'll be exiting the same way. Uh, in the meantime, through this whole process, the crew uh, and the Dragon itself will remain with the LES, the uh, Launch Escape System, armed. Uh, so the, if in any event something were to happen as part of the offloading process, they'll be able to escape using the Super Draco engines, the eight Super Dracos that are on the Dragon. Uh, it'll be a pad of bore over into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but for now, all the ground teams are tracking uh, that everything is nominal. The fuel offload is going as planned as part of a normal scrub, uh, and we're just continuing to follow along. That's right. And one thing I want to mention, uh, although this is not what we had hoped to happen today, um, and while we said that this is a nominal uh, abort configuration, uh, technically the crew and the launch teams have already practiced this very similar scenario. On Thursday, February 23rd, um, the integrated launch operations teams, along with the astronauts, um, performed a full dry dress rehearsal, which basically means a, a total dress dress rehearsal, including suit up, uh, transporting to the pad, going up the elevators in the crew tower, down the crew access arm and ingressing into the capsule, um, and basically doing a full rehearsal of launch day um, as if it were real, but no no propellant involved. So that's why it's called a dry dress rehearsal because there, there was no propellant involved. Um, so technically, this is very similar to what they would have done on Thursday in terms of uh, simulating that, that scrub and basically having their teams go back up into the crew uh, tower and retrieve the astronauts from the capsule. So at this point in time, we are following along 
with the procedures for this unfortunate scrub, um, but everything continues to track nominally for this activity. Um, right now, for those that have recently joined, uh, we had a hold called on the countdown at about T minus two and a half minutes. Um, the crew had reported around T minus five minutes, or excuse me, the ground teams uh, had, uh, the SpaceX ground teams had reported around T minus five minutes an issue with the T-TEB, um, which is the, um, uh, basically the stuff that we use to ignite the engines on the first stage. Uh, so the, out of an abundance of caution, the teams called that hold at T minus two and a half minutes and uh, then proceeded into nominal off um, detanking or or basically um, unloading the vehicle with all of its propellants. Um, given the fact that that occurred at T minus uh, two and a half minutes, uh, the majority of the propellants were already Dragon on the vehicle. SpaceX with the propellant load, propellant offload update. Uh, SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. Offloads are proceeding nominally, anticipating another half hour until closeout. Understand, look at about a half hour to close the uh, three copy. Thank you. All right, so good news there coming from the ground teams, indicating that we have about 30 minutes left of the propellant offloading. Uh, we heard Commander Steve Bowen. Um, sounding pretty unbothered by everything. Like I mentioned before, uh, everything is written down in the procedure. They practiced uh, this very similar egress procedure during Thursday night's dry dress rehearsal. So all in all, um, everything continuing nominally there for uh, this, these next steps. As I mentioned before, uh, we will see eventually the crew access arm swing back into the service position and we will have the the pad teams re-enter um, the, the pad area and, and basically enable the astronauts to egress. I also mentioned earlier that our backup launch opportunity is um, about the same time tomorrow, um, roughly 24 hours uh, after our initial T0. Due to the fact that we were launching uh, the crew that you see there on the right hand side of your screen, they were headed to the International Space Station. Um, as such, that is down to the very second in terms of catching up to the International Space Station when launching from, uh, from Kennedy Space Center. So um, when it comes to crew launches, there's only one shot. Um, and so therefore, due to that scrub that was called at T minus two and a half minutes, uh, that was our only opportunity to launch today. That's right, Kay. And as you mentioned, that scrub would be 24 hours. Uh, so we'll get to do this all over again. You mentioned the dry dress rehearsal. Uh, with a nominal offload of the fuel for this particular scrub, this is almost like a wet dress rehearsal, just taking it one step uh, further. As you mentioned, for the dry dress, they did everything that we saw today, driving out to the pad, going up the elevators, and uh, making their way into the vehicle, buckling up. The seats rotated, uh, and they made their way far into the countdown, but, but before they started fueling the vehicle. Now uh, they fueled the vehicle prior to launch, and again, we're following a scrub at the, that was occurred at about two minutes and 30 seconds prior to the T0 time. Uh, due to tracking a, uh, a ground issue with the T-TEB ignition fluid that's used on the engines to ignite them and uh, fire the crew into orbit and eventually catching up with the International Space Station. Uh, but as they were continuing to look at this issue, decided to declare a scrub for today. That scrub is, again, a nominal scrub, um, so we'll be going through uh, the scrub procedures, which include the detanking. They seem to be going a little faster than originally predicted. They called out to the crew about five zero minutes. Now we're inside 30 minutes uh, from detanking the Falcon 9. That means the RP-1 uh, refined kerosene. And the liquid oxygen, that's the, the densified liquid oxygen that's on board, is uh, being brought back into the lines that fuel them. 
uh, so we'll be emptying those tanks. You can still see some of the oxygen, some of the gaseous oxygen billowing off the Falcon 9 rocket itself. So there is a little bit of fuel in there. You're seeing some of the puffs that are part of the detanking process. In the meantime, just a reminder that that launch escape system is armed through the whole thing just to keep the crew safe. But you see, for the crew themselves, it's a very passive experience, the launch scrub, all of these commands being issued by the teams on the ground. Um, They'll continue to wait uh, until uh, and, and get status updates from the ground teams. Uh, right now, they are uh, connected by umbilical. Uh, we did hear that as part of the normal countdown, the Falcon 9 transferred to internal power, uh, but they re-enabled auxiliary power back into the vehicle. So through the detanking process, we're getting power from the ground uh, and not relying on the uh, on the batteries inside the vehicles. So we can continue to work through this process. Again, Steve Bowen, uh, Woody Hoberg, Sultan Alniati, and Andrei Fedyaev on board. Crew Dragon Endeavor now passively waiting uh, for the scrub process, detaking fuel first. This is going to be one of the lengthier processes uh, before the crew access arm swings back and allows the crew to egress or exit the Dragon vehicle and get back on the ground. We'll do the same thing again in then about 24 hours. Uh, witnessing the same series of events suiting up in the suit room uh, before going down uh, and making their way over to the pad via Tesla uh, until they make their way up the um, launch tower, the uh, elevators over there, and make their way back into the same vehicle. We'll continue to follow along and give you updates as we hear them right now. Uh, really, it's just the detanking process, which is uh, quite a lengthy process, so we'll continue to keep you updated there. That is still underway. That's one of the longer uh, events that occur as part of a normal scrub. From left to right, Andre Fedyaev. Woody Hoberg, Steve Bowen, Sultan Alniati on board at Crew Dragon Endeavor now. Now we'll continue to follow along through this process, but from here over in Hawthorne, we're now going to toss it back over to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, where, again, we scrubbed at about 2 minutes 30 seconds to take us through uh, and continue to give us updates along the scrub process. Daryl. All right, thanks so much, Gary. Back here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Daryl Nail, and I'm with Crew 3 Commander, NASA astronaut Raja Chari. And it goes without saying, Raja, looks like you're going to have to wait <laughs> on <laughs> seeing your first launch. As uh, Gary mentioned, we had a scrub at uh, right around 1.43 a.m. Eastern Time. Got down inside T minus 10 minutes, and uh, they started to notice an issue with what's called T-TAB, and the, these are the chemicals that help yep. ignite the Falcon 9 uh, engines, all nine of them. And uh, as it turned out, uh, it looks like there wasn't enough confidence in moving forward with the amount of TTEB that was there to light those engines, and so we, uh, we had a scrub called. And so now, from the astronaut's perspective, Raja, you're sitting in there. First of all, tell me about what kind of reacts yeah, so I think it's it's uh, good and bad, right? The the bad side is obviously you know you're ready to go, uh, been waiting for it. But I think what's really encouraging and what uh, you know especially we're appreciative as the astronauts is knowing that everyone's got our back and that safety is the paramount thing. So as much as everyone wants to go, the right thing to do is obviously in this case to scrub. Uh, and so I think that's really easy to remember when you're in the seat and when you're dealing with, you know, as you go through the process of dearming the launch escape system, all those steps just remind you like, oh yeah, this the safety has got to be first. Um, I think it's also kind of a good deal because it gets a, a free run through of all the events and the timeline. So now they've seen it all once, um, they have the wet dress, but now you've taken it all the way down to, to near launch and you get a 
another run of that, another run through of the procedures. Um, we talked earlier in the night about sleep shifting, so they're already sleep shifted. Uh, they're, you know, that's why we <laughs> do it that way, so that they're, you know, you can continue uh, and uh, know earlier than tomorrow uh, another launch opportunity. Um, so I think that's kind of what's going through the mind right now. You heard earlier the call up from the core to get into 5.100, so that's the procedure they're running now. Earlier in the night, they're using 4.100 is the procedure name, and that's what was the launch prep, and this is the scrub prep. And so as a rough rule of thumb, what they teach the crew is about as long as you were fueling, it'll take that long to defuel. So mm -hmm. since we were pretty deep into the count, you would expect to take about that amount of time to un basically take all the fuel out of the rocket. So the, the big picture is, um, you know, the crew's going to stay there just like they were ready for launch with the visors down, completely restrained, uh, because the rocket still has prop on board. And so the launch escape system is still armed. So it is still a volatile <laughs> right. machine. Right, propellant yeah, on exactly. board. So exactly. Yeah, yeah, so we still have to treat it uh, as if it's ready to go, as it, it is ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then once the prop is all off, then they can disarm the uh, launch escape system, bring the crew access arm back out, and then egress the vehicle. So essentially, what we saw early in the night just run back in, in reverse. Um, and then uh, I think it's also a good example. You mentioned like inside T minus 10 minutes is when we started to see some ground chatter and know there was an issue. You didn't hear that on the loops to the, the crew. And one of the reasons is, you know, we work a lot in training to figure out like, what do you tell the crew? What don't you tell the crew? Um, but generally speaking, if there's nothing the crew can do about something or, you know, in this case, there's an action being worked, um, then maybe it would maybe potentially only confuse the situation to, to give them extraneous information. In this case, uh, once they had actionable info, like, hey, we we're going to scrub, or we're looking at this, um, that's when they call it up uh, versus just peppering them with random <laughs> yeah. random pieces of information that may or may not be relevant. Um, in today's case, it turned out to be relevant, but they let them know that once that that was the case. But, but yeah, I think uh, from the crew standpoint, this is something we, you know, just about, uh, you know, honestly, our launch was the first time we ever had an event where nothing went wrong because in all the sims you do, something generally goes wrong, that's the whole point. Right. So if this is actually par for the course, that you're like, oh, yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah. of course something happened because that's what always happens at the Sim. That's how you Sim. Yeah, that's yeah. how you Sim. Uh, so I th think it's unexpected. Um, and with, uh, I mean, I think we relearn this every time we launch a vehicle, whether it's Artemis, uh, you know, SpaceX Dragon, a Starliner, we always learn things and you can uh, never assume everything's going to go perfectly. So I don't think it surprises anyone, not to say that they're not disappointed. I, you know, you're, there's still that. That's uh, probably the first <laughs> The in, first in thing reaction, is like, right? oh man, but yeah. then like, oh, that's good. Right. They, they made the safe decision. But yeah, absolutely a little disappointed. But uh, yeah, w you're still going to get to go to space. We'll just maybe do it a, a day or two later. And currently, according to uh, SpaceX, when they initially made the announcement, it takes about 50 minutes to detank the rocket. And currently, we're right around a half hour. Uh, left in right. that process, so we've gone about 20 minutes in detanking. As you mentioned, astronauts have to stay strapped in exactly where they are to wait it out as that propellant is detanked. And I found that you can kind of get a visual marker by what you see right here, right? The uh, You can see Got some venting, the and yep. venting of the locks at the top, but then also just about as high as that can condensation is coming off Dragon the rocket. SpaceX with propellant offload update. Now we get an update. SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. Our stage two LOX tank is offloaded. Uh, we're still tracking about another 25 to 30 minutes here. Last estimate may have been a little low. SpaceX Dragon copy, thank you for the update. about halfway done. Uh, about halfway, and you can see yeah, it's you're almost about halfway I, I, down. I actually never noticed that <laughs> yeah. before, but that's actually a really good, really good insight. And so, and so now the astronauts are waiting in the capsule. SpaceX is looking at, and will look at, after this procedure is, is complete, um, what's going on with the hardware. There is a launch opportunity tomorrow, and I want to emphasize this is an opportunity um, if the team decides that they can turn it around in 24 hours. And that would be with a T0 of 122 and 29 seconds a.m. Eastern time. Again, tomorrow, well, this would be Tuesday, February 28th, with a T0 of 122 and 29 seconds a.m. There is a launch opportunity 
if NASA and SpaceX decide to go forward with that, our coverage on NASA TV would start at 9.45 p.m., both on NASA TV and our streaming platforms. Also, from launch to dock, that transit would be about 33 and a half hours. So if they decide to launch on that day, docking would happen on March 1st at 10.04 Eastern Time. And there'd be a rendezvous, docking, and welcoming ceremony coverage on NASA TV that would start at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. And I say all that, again, with the asterisk that that is a decision that has yet to be made, whether or Absolutely. not they take the, that la launch opportunity. There's yep. going to be a time to look at this situation. Right, and so like we heard that it was a, a situation with the T-Tab, which is again, sort of the, if you will, the igniter for the engines and making sure the fluid, there was enough fluid or sufficient fluid. So whatever that, yeah, whatever the technical uh, underlying of that problem that led to today, if that's something that can be resolved, and obviously that's something the teams will be diving into probably as soon as the prop is off the rocket, I'm sure they're going to be crawling all over it. And that's, that's one of the other logistical things that's happening here. So there's, you know, once they start fueling the rocket as part of the countdown sequence and the crew uh, armed the launch escape system, all the personnel around there also cleared out. And so right now there is no one really close to the rocket. So once the fuel is off the rocket um, and then the crew de-arms the LES, then people can approach again. So it does take some some time for the vehicles and people and the closeout crew, just like it did to, you know, clear out the arm and, and prep it. They'll have to do the same thing to bring people back to the arm, um, re-prepare it to connect to the, the capsule. Um, but again, it's actually in the long run kind of a good thing is that when they do try this the second time, it means it'll go all the more smoother because they'll, they'll have got another rep of doing it. Um, you mentioned the, the one thing having a a longer time to rendezvous, the 33 hours. Actually, that's kind of another little, uh, maybe a, a, a positive silver lining out of this, because I know for us, for Crew 3, we really enjoyed our time in the capsule. You spend so much time mm. training in Hawthorne, training uh, in Houston, um, and there's something special, I think, about being in a, a small vehicle. Yes, it's cramped, uh, so I wouldn't necessarily want to spend two weeks in there, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, uh, more than a few hours is just kind of fun. because Stop, you're catch your breath, exactly, relax. Yeah. Because once you hit the space station, you are on a tight timeline. Everything, mm -hmm. you know, every five minutes is accounted for, and it should be because, you know, it's, it's expensive to get there, and we're doing a whole lot of science. Um, the nice thing in the, in the vehicle when you're just rendezvousing or waiting for those, we talked about phasing the orbits, you get time to just look out the window, hang out with your buds. It's uh, kind of like a, you know, a glamping trip. Because <laughs> 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 like, um, you're, you know, sort of uh, rough at it, but... Uh, Obviously, it's some pretty nice digs. But um, you can get out of your seat, right? Exactly, and that's, that's so it's, it's a great time. Yeah. So once they get uh, in orbit uh, and everything's checked out, they do get out of their seats. They can change out of their suits. Uh, and I thought that was some of the, the best time, both on the way up and the way down, just spending time in the Dragon and in the thing that you've trained in so long. Um, and you can really hear it. It talks to you. You can hear when you do burns. You'll hear the prop flowing. You can see the thrusters out the window. Um, so it's a, it's a nice time. Uh, and it gives you some time to adapt to space. So for especially in, in our our crew, just like their crew, having three rookies on board, um, getting some time to adapt to zero gravity, getting used to moving around, how you restrain yourself. Uh, the more time you can get in the Dragon, the the quicker you can adapt and get to work on the on the space station. So I think it's all time well spent when you have a, a few extra hours uh, in the Dragon. Raj has talked a lot about uh, the crew and uh, what that means for them um, going potentially going forward. I um, want to go back to the T-Tab. We've, we've mentioned this and heard it a couple of times. I think uh, one of our commentators actually spelled it out. If you look at the picture on the left, the SpaceX rocket on the pad, uh, for those who are familiar with watching launches at night, that T-Tab, it's the, it's the uh, ignition fluid. You can actually see it light because it flashes green all around the bottom of the rocket. You can see a green flash. And that's what it does. It lights those nine uh, Merlin engines, and then you have a liftoff. And uh, they call it TTEB because that's the acronym for triethyl aluminum, triethyl boron. And when they come together, they, they create they that, yeah. Yeah, that ignition that's necessary to, uh, to light the rocket. And so that's something that SpaceX is uh, going to look at. We also heard an update uh, from uh, SpaceX on the loops about the, the timing of the detank, which we are currently 
Uh, just about 25, 27 minutes into that process, as uh, astronaut Raja Chari was saying, this is uh, a period of time where the astronauts just have to hold still while the propellant is taken out of the rocket. Yep, and they're probably also going through uh, so we're, we're always trying to think, what, what, what if, what if, what if? That's mm -hmm. always what's going through our mind. So right now they're probably thinking through, uh, well, the, the LES is still hot, so that was, you know, but we're not planning on going. So if there was a problem, we'd probably hit the emergency ground aggress button, wait for the crew arm to swing out at that faster rate. Well, crew arm, oh, sorry, crew arm sorry. attached, yep, right? So yeah, but, uh, yeah, but you would still want to, if you had to get out quickly, do the emergency ground aggress, make sure the LES is disarmed before you get out of your seats. Uh, and then and then egress if you had to, uh, and so there's there's a few different ways, a uh, few different types of egress in if something else went wrong, and uh, so whenever prop is moving, whether it's getting onloaded or offloaded, uh, you're always ready for that. Um, so that LES stays armed through this process. It actually stays armed as long as there's propellant on the uh, the rocket. It stays armed because if there was uh, any kind of contingency, you'd want to use that to get off quickly. The other thing that they'll ha will have to happen eventually is they'll have to rotate the seats back. Uh, so just like we saw this, the seats rotate to the launch position, uh, once the LES is disarmed, then they'll rotate back to the, you know, the loading and unloading configuration. Um, there's also, uh, we didn't talk about it uh, too much, but uh, it's not just people that the Dragon takes up there, it's cargo. And so uh, you can't really see in this view. We saw for earlier in the night when they were first loading up, you got a Behind shot underneath the their legs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and so you can see the cargo that's under there and that the stuff on the left under Andre's seat is mostly uh, crew related in terms of like survival equipment. You see that red, you can kind of just see the yeah. uh, red bag. That's the like the life raft. and so. We talked, you saw that video earlier tonight, we talked about the Orion, the porch, and you know, the Orion water training. So a lot of the water recovery equipment is in those, those pallets underneath Andre's seat if, if the crew had to do something on their own uh, for some kind of uh, landing in an unplanned area. And then this stuff that's kind of under Woody and Steve's seats, you can see they look like more like metal lockers. And so those uh, positions actually have power. So under Andre and Sultan's seats, there's no power to those locations, those cargo locations, but the ones under Woody and Steve, they actually have power, which means you can cool or heat things, but generally when you're talking about science, going up and back from the station, oftentimes you need to keep stuff frozen mm -hmm. or temperature controlled, and so those, usually the uh, probably the more valuable, I'm sure it's valuable, but like the, the more time critical time stuff is in those, and so more than likely when they offload the crew, uh, we'll probably won't be on camera anymore, but they'll probably also go in and either you know, take some of that stuff out if there's anything that has to be chilled or temperature controlled to make sure it's it's still in a good state. Uh, and then when you dock with the station, those are some of the first things that come off um, to make sure that they get into Dragon the right. SpaceX with propellant offload update. SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. Offloads are proceeding nominally, expecting another 15, 20 minutes here. Okay, so and that's Captain Stephen Boeing communicating with the launch team. Exactly, yep, in about another 15 to 20 minutes, and sounds like things are going nominally. But yeah, so the uh, those pallets underneath there, like I said, they may, I'm not exactly sure what's in those particular ones, but it would not be uncommon to, to pull some of that stuff, they call it like late load cargo that, uh, you know, for is very sensitive to temperature or maybe some power considerations that you would pull off and and store, and then, like I said, when you dock, those are the first things that, that come out. But again, the kind of takeaway is it's not just people, but a whole bunch of stuff that goes right. to the space station by way of the Dragon. And then you can also put things in the trunk as well, um, on like the cargo Dragons. We used the, we saw it earlier tonight, the solar panels, but you can load things into the trunk. Uh, here's a great shot of it. So that bottom section that looks uh, with the solar panels and the black and the white inside solar there, on one side yep, and, yeah. you can actually put things inside there as well uh, that obviously it doesn't have to be in a nice atmosphere or uh, so it's the things that can be exposed to vacuum all right good stuff nasa astronaut raja chari keeping us informed and updated on what the astronauts are going through and what it means for the cargo on board i want to now take a moment to go back to spacex in hawthorne california and get caught up with our nasa commentator gary jordan gary Hey, thank you, Daryl. 
Yeah, we're following along here in uh, Mission Control Hawthorne. As you mentioned, that status update on the fuel offloading, we're looking at about 15, 20 minutes until that is completed. In the meantime, you see the Crew-6 astronauts on board inside Crew Dragon Endeavor, uh, passively waiting. They'll be going through uh, a, a series of more steps once fuel offloading is complete. In the meantime, um, the uh, the Dragon is going to, or the Falcon 9 is going to continue to uh, uh, get rid of the fuel and the oxidizer that's inside the Falcon 9. Um, the seats themselves will rotate from the launch position down uh, so that the uh, closeout team can come back and uh, get them out of their seats. They'll open up that side hatch and uh, get the crew back, walk down the crew access arm, down the elevators, and uh, go back to crew quarters to await for the next launch attempt. Right now, uh, the next launch attempt we're looking at is about 24 hours uh, from now. Um, but right now, if you're if you're just tuning in uh, and looking for updates on uh, the launch of the Crew Dragon to the International Space Station, we are in a launch scrub situation. So at about two minutes thirty seconds, uh, the team's ground teams declared a scrub due to tracking what's called a TTEB. Um, this is the ignition fluid that allows the uh, engines on the first and second stage to ignite and propel uh, the Falcon 9 and the crew into orbit over the nine-minute ascent. Uh, usually, if you follow our, our coverage, TTEB, uh, when the second stage ignites uh, at about three minutes uh, into the flight of the Falcon 9, there is this green flash that you see from the MVAC engine at the tip and then the titanium uh, stabilization ring at the end of the expansion nozzle uh, uh, goes away after that TTEB ignition and the and the second stage ignites. That's That green flash is the TTEB uh, ignition fluid, and you can actually see it in our launch coverage. But it was that uh, that the ground teams were tracking, uh, and so they identified a ground issue and are now uh, going through the stages of a nominal, uh, a nominal um, scrub situation just regular uh, tank offloading. We were originally looking at about 50 minutes of tank offloading. Now we're about 15, 20 minutes uh, from the latest report of the ground teams. In the meantime, the crew six astronauts are aboard, uh, passively waiting and tracking the, uh, um, tracking the fuel offload. And why don't we check in with Kate for, for more on the scrub situation. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I am following along with the SpaceX ground team's procedures um, as we are continuing through this nominal scrub. Um, as we heard called out a couple minutes ago, um, we uh, have about 15 to 20 minutes left of the offload. Um, so that should wrap up between 12, excuse me, around between 2.30 and 4.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so we're coming up to that soon, everything progressing nominally. Um, Looking at the current levels, um, I'm expecting a call out to occur any minute now, uh, indicating that all RP1 has been detanked from the second stage. So um, liquid oxygen uh, detanking has already completed from the second stage. So I'm expecting that call out to come any second now, indicating that RP-1 has been completely detanked. Um, as for the first stage, also really low levels there. I would say less than 5% remaining locks on the first stage to go, um, and then probably about 10% fuel left to go uh, there on the first stage. So we're nearly there, um, but we will hear those progress call outs uh, on the loops informing the crew. As you can see there on the right hand side of your screen, uh, they remain comfortable in their seats, visors down, seats rotated back. Um, the launch escape system is still armed at this point. Um, although from that view of the pad on the left hand side of your screen, it might kind of look like the crew access arm is um, reaching toward the capsule. It's not. We have not moved that yet um, into the service position, it, and we won't do that um, for a little bit yet. Uh, but we still have a number of things that we're going to go through. Um, 
in this nominal offload procedure. As I mentioned before, the crew had a dry dress rehearsal on Thursday night, meaning no propellant involved. Um, so that what that's what makes it a dry dress. Uh, but they have gone through this very similar procedure in terms of the uh, closeout team going back up into the tower, back down the crew access arm and helping the crew get out of the capsule, including reopening that side hatch. So the astronauts will egress from the capsule the exact same way that they ingressed, just in reverse. Uh, so pretty simple from that standpoint, but there are also other things that uh, we'll have to do um, in, uh, in addition to that that fuel detanking or offloading uh, and the disarming of that launch escape system. Um, we will also check with the hypergol sensors that those hypergolic fluids, um, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen te tetroxide, uh, that MMH and NTO, those are the fuels that are used to power Dragon when it's in orbit and uh, they are toxic to humans to breathe. So we will engage those sensors and make sure that there's a zero, um, you know, that there's no presence of those propellants uh, prior to allowing the closeout team return to the white room. Uh, we'll also make sure that the closeout crew themselves are prepared and ready to re-enter the BDA or blast danger area. Uh, so it's basically everything that they did earlier today, but in reverse. Um, and then another thing that we will also do is we will release the range assets. So of course, all of that Ground, excuse me, all of that sea and airspace that we had uh, closed off in preparation for launch. Uh, after that launch escape system is disabled, we'll be able to basically release or free up all of those range assets that are still currently locked down um, just in case a, a launch abort, uh, excuse me, a dragon abort, a pad abort in this case would be triggered. But as we mentioned before, everything continues to progress nominally with no issues. Dragon uh, SpaceX with the propellant offload up. Very exciting, go ahead. At this time, we have RP-1 and locks off of stage two, expecting just another five minutes or so here until we are fully offloaded. Very exciting, coffee, thank you. So that was SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt, uh, just informing the crew that there's about five minutes remaining. As I mentioned before, um, at this point in time, the second stage is now completely mo or mostly empty, completely empty of, of its propellants. The LOX tank on the first stage is nearly empty and the fuel tank on the first stage has maybe about 5% remaining uh, to be pulled out. So everything continuing normally with this offload. Um, we heard their commander, Steve Bowen, as I mentioned earlier, um, it sounds, he sounds pretty relaxed and um, cool as an ice cube here. And for good reason, the astronauts train for every possible scenario, this included. Um, as we've mentioned several times before, we have procedures for everything. Um, I am following along with this uh, scrub procedure and um, everything continues to, to go um, as planned, which is kind of funny to say for um, an event that we obviously didn't want to happen tonight, but um, as uh, John Innsbrucker reminded me a little bit ago, uh, the uh, uh, the Mercury flight director said back in the early days of the space program, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were flying than to be flying wishing you were on the ground. So um, this is a good example of um, the system doing exactly what it was supposed to do um, in the case of off nominal uh, TTEB readings. Uh, there was a scrub called at about two minutes and 30 seconds um, prior to liftoff. And uh, that was an issue that the, the, the crew had in that, excuse me, that the ground teams had informed the crew of around T minus five minutes had indicated that they would need a couple more minutes to troubleshoot the problem and ultimately called that scrub at T minus two minutes and 30 seconds. So at this point in time, the crew remains in their chairs. Um, unfortunately, not a whole lot for them to do other than mo continue to monitor uh, using their crew displays, continue to monitor the progress of the propellant offloading and uh, the overall vehicle health. Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, 
the commander's tone of voice indicates that everyone is, um, I'm sure, disappointed that they didn't get to go to space today, um, but unbothered or not worried about what we're walking through as we have practiced, um, practiced a, a similar scenario very recently with that dry dress rehearsal just this past Thursday evening. Um, so after we fully detank the vehicle, uh, we will be able to disarm the launch escape system and then bring that crew access arm, which a great shot there on the left-hand side of your screen of it uh, stowed away. We will basically rotate it back into its uh, service position and um, the closeout team will, um, I guess it will be the opposite, more of like a close-in team. Um, they will return to the pad and uh, go back up to the side hatch, reopen it and help the astronauts out of their seats. That's right, Kate. And again, uh, we're getting that live view from inside the Dragon. They are passively waiting. It's the ground teams monitoring uh, the detanking process, which we're really just minutes away from finishing. In the meantime, we continue to keep that launch escape system armed just to make sure the crew is safe through the process. Now, after that detanking is complete, one of the next steps will be to disarm uh, the uh, launch escape system. When the Falcon 9 is not fueled, um, the, it's in a safe configuration to go ahead and disarm that and go through the next series of steps, including that crew access arm swinging back and uh, retrieving the crew. Now, Crew 6 will have another opportunity to launch. Right now, we're tracking a 24-hour turnaround uh, for the next launch attempt. Of course, the teams on the ground will have to evaluate and continue to evaluate uh, the uh, issue that was identified as part of today's launch scrub. And again, that was a, a ground issue identified with the TTEB ignition fluid uh, that allows the uh, first and second stage engines to ignite and propel the Falcon 9 and the Dragon into orbit. So they'll continue to talk and discuss about the issues before going ahead and proceeding with that next attempt, but we have that identified. Uh, if we were to proceed with a launch attempt tomorrow, uh, again, today's launch attempt, we were counting down to 1.45 a.m. Eastern time for tomorrow for a 24-hour scrub. It's just about 24 hours, a little shy of that, so we'd be looking at about 1.22 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow uh, for uh, our next attempt. In the meantime, we're continuing to follow along just really minutes away uh, from uh, completely detanking the Falcon 9. Uh, so we'll continue to follow along and get this next status update uh, until that's completely uh, detanked and we hear that they're disarming the launch escape system. All right, so Kate, we're continuing to follow along, um, really just uh, sitting and waiting at this point for that detanking process, but we should be expecting to hear something from the ground teams very shortly. Yeah, that's right. We continue to see the crew remaining buckled in their seats, um, keeping their hands inside the ride at all times <laughs> for a lack of a better analogy. Uh, yeah, their visors remain in the closed position. Um, this of course is, as you just mentioned, the launch escape system is still armed. Uh, so while it is armed, the crew will stay exactly as you see them now. Um, this is just in case a, for some reason, um, a Dragon pad abort is required. Um, as I mentioned before, not likely, but it's a good backup. Um, of course, crew safety is the top priority at all times, uh, even as we work through this nominal scrub um, uh, procedure. So we will see the crew remain like this uh, until uh, further notice, basically. Uh, checking in on vehicle status here, as I mentioned before, the second stage completely empty uh, of all of its propellants, the first stage uh, LOX tank also basically completely empty. I'm seeing a tiny little bit of fuel, that RP-1 rocket propellant one still coming off of the first stage tank there. Um, but for the most part, uh, Falcon 9 is basically entirely empty of its propellants at this point in time. So as I mentioned before, we were expecting uh, this to wrap up sometime between 2.30 a.m. and 2.40 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so now at uh, 2.33, uh, we are in that range. So we should be hearing momentarily uh, from SpaceX core Arthur Berrialt um, 
located here at SpaceX Hawthorne Mission Control, just behind Gary and I. Um, we should hear from him soon, indicating that the propellant offloading is complete and that uh, we will then prepare to disarm the launch escape system. Um, so for those that have recently tuned in, uh, we had a nominal countdown. Um, the, t the SpaceX teams reported um, a t issue with the T-TEB, um, the, basically the fluids that we use to ignite the Merlin engines. You can kind of think of it like the spark plug to your car if you drive a combustion engine vehicle. Um, so that T-TEB is a critical component to getting the rocket to fly. It's, it's what creates the spark um, for that engine ignition. Um, so we heard around T minus five minutes that the uh, SpaceX teams were troubleshooting an issue. And then about two and a half minutes later at T minus two minutes, 30 seconds, there was a scrub called uh, in the launch down, excuse me, in the launch countdown. But as I said, Prior to that, uh, we had a, a nominal countdown, and now just working through this uh, this scrub procedure. Dragon SpaceX with a propellant offload update. SpaceX Dragon, go ahead. At this time, we have all propellant off the vehicle and are proceeding with nominal closeouts. SpaceX Dragon copies. All right, so that's an important call. Propellant load, or the propellant offload, rather, being complete. So we'll be uh, we'll be tracking to see when the uh, launch escape system gets disarmed. Right now, it's still armed, just as a precautionary measure. Measure as the ground teams continue to track uh, the Dragon propellant. Dragon SpaceX with that call. You are go for section two of five decimal 100 and disarm launch escape system. Here we go. All right, and I'm and not sure what call that was that you're referring to, other than that we are go for two decimal hold, uh, break, one break. for launch escape system safely. And copy that. Good read back, Dragon. Okay, we so are in launch escape system safing. We are at 2 Alpha 1, and we're at 2 Alpha 2 with this on the launch escape system. So again, if you're just tuning in, the uh, ground teams were, t were tracking propellant offload. So it'll be the crew themselves inside Crew Dragon Endurance that issues the command to turn off. The launch escape system will wait for confirmation of that command being successfully issued to the Dragon system. Right, and it looks like we uh, got that confirmation that the launch escape system has been inhibited. So that uh, that confirms the uh, propellant offload and the launch Go escape system being uh, disarmed. So the crew will work right, uh, through a series of commands. We're going to go with advisors and proceed to step three. Dragon, we are ready for a steep rotation. SpaceX copies will report when initiating. 
Okay, so a uh, recap of what happened. We uh, declared a scrub inside two minutes, 30 seconds. That scrub time was actually two minutes, 14 seconds. Dragon SpaceX um, initiating And we scrubbed for the day. Uh, since then, we've been in a nominal scrub uh, procedure. So it, it uh, was followed. So we're continuing to follow along. And uh, that uh, crew access arm, we did get confirmation. You can see it visually, actually. It is swinging back into place to access the side hatch on the side of Crew Dragon Endeavor. So again, the uh, Falcon 9 is completely offloaded with fuel and oxidizer, and the launch escape system has been disarmed. Those commands confirmed before going ahead and swinging the crew access arm back. You heard the uh, command for seat rotation. So we may be able to see that. And before launch, the seat rotates up to about a 14 degree angle. That's the seat, that's the launch position. The seat rotation goes down to about a 40 degree okay, angle SpaceX to allow- the upright position. SpaceX Dragon Cops. So there we can see the crew access arm closing the final inches as it moves back toward Dragon Endeavor. Um, we are now pulling the closeout team to re-enter the BDA or blast danger area. Um, so as we've mentioned before, they will go back up the tower, back down the crew access arm, uh, reopen that side hatch and help the astronauts egress from the capsule. Um, as we heard called out earlier, the seats are back down in uh, so they were in the launch position. They've rotated back down uh, into the egress, uh, ingress position. Uh, so we can see the crew access arm just closing the final inches um, up against Dragon Endeavor. At this point in time, we're gonna head back over to Kennedy Space Center's Daryl uh, for additional updates. Um, I, I'm sure that they can see the, they were able to see that crew access arm move uh, from their seats at the press site. Daryl, how are things over there? Thank you, Kate, and yes, indeed, we uh, could see the crew access arm uh, coming back and making a connection with Dragon Endeavor. And as you see on the screen there, the white room, connected back in. And so as we watch the astronauts can unbuckle and pull up their visors, take a moment to uh, relax. And uh, from here on, Commander Chari, looks like they'll be heading out at some point. They should be, yeah. And at this point, the vehicle's uh, pretty much completely safe. So with the LES uh, disarmed or safed, um, there's basically no longer active prop in the F-9, and also the Super Dracos are safed on the vehicle. So uh, there, that completes their procedure 5.100, which is the one they're running inside the vehicle at this point. They're just waiting for the uh, recovery crew to, to show up. Um, like was mentioned earlier, they have to stay outside in the exclusion area uh, while there's any potential of propellants or the, the abort engines kicking off. And so now that that's safe, those teams will approach the vehicle. Um, you can see they loosen their straps. Uh, you know, one of the questions we were talking about while we were uh, listening to SpaceX was why don't they just get out on their own, which they could. Um, but uh, we mentioned before that whole white room is a clean room. And so if they were to get out on their own, they maybe like, like scuff a boot, uh, touch a hatch seal. And since all those things we want to keep really pristine, there's, there's no rush right now. There's no reason to risk anything like that, you know, bumping a visor, scratching something, tearing a rubber seal. So the safest thing to do, uh, since we're going to have to do this again on the next opportunity, is to let the closeout crew come and make sure they help them out and make sure nothing is, you know, nothing gets damaged or anything like that on the way out and, um, and preserve the opportunity, uh, those follow on opportunities. The good news is the next opportunities will probably go faster because everyone's done it once now. So they've got some, <laughs> they've got some more practice. Uh, they don't have to sign the patch, like you said, we've, they've knocked that out. Uh, so we save ourselves a few seconds here and there. Um, and again, that's uh, for the crew, uh, you know, although there's the, the, some, you know, uh, disappointment of like, oh, you didn't get to go, but 
it feels a lot just like another sim and another chance to go through the procedures, mm -hmm. another chance because, like we talked about, once that rocket lights, things happen really, really fast. So the more times you have to, to walk through it and talk through it, um, and especially in a case like this, we're actually sitting in the seats with the displays up, hearing the vehicle sounds, um, that in and of itself is a, a worthwhile experience. Um, and it, it makes you more uh, perceptive if things aren't nominal. So the next time if you hear a sound, they're like, well, that was, that's not, that's different than what we heard before and, and have a, a baseline for comparison. Uh, it looks like Woody's playing with his box settings. So now that their visor's up, they're probably changing their settings just so they're not getting background noise. You can see they're starting to get their, their gloves out. Unzip. Uh, yep, getting their hands out and just uh, get a little more, uh, just cool off and um, yeah, just uh, kind of hanging out and relaxing for the, waiting for the crew to come sh get them. So Crew 6 uh, did a dry dress just a few days ago. We could think of this as, <laughs> as a, a wet, wet dress. dress exactly, right? yep, this one had the problem. And so the more experience they get, uh, the better off they'll be for the next attempt. Just to recap, if you're just joining us, we scrubbed the launch attempt at T minus two minutes and 14 seconds before <laughs> liftoff. Um, there was a hold in the countdown, happened at 1.43 a.m. Eastern time. The SpaceX team, uh, encountered an issue in the ground system affecting the loading of triethyl aluminum and triethyl boron, which together, the acronym TTEB, they are the ignition fluids for F9. The ground team couldn't provide sufficient confidence of a full load of that TTEB, which is important to light all nine of the Merlin 1D engines underneath the Falcon 9. So the team scrubbed it and uh, now they're going through their procedures uh, for launch scrub. And so moving forward, we have some launch opportunities coming up for Crew-6. I mentioned the first one on February 28th. There's also another one on March 2nd at 12.34 a.m. Eastern Time. Yeah. And if we were to go then, we would uh, begin our NASA TV coverage on March 1st at 9.30 p.m. And there would be a docking at 1.05 a.m. Eastern Time on March 3rd. Also want to make a note that there is no press conference tonight. Initially, that was scheduled. Um, had there been a nominal uh, launch, uh, but in this case, uh, NASA is foregoing the opportunity for a press conference, and so stay tuned to your social media channels and NASA's and official SpaceX commercial crew update. blog. Uh, we've pulled go for the closeout team uh, to start re-entering the BDA, and they'll be back alongside you at the capsule shortly uh, and helping you egress. Additionally, just want to do a quick comfort check, uh, make sure you guys are still feeling okay sitting there, and if you need a PMC, I can set one up. And wait for Captain Bowen to respond. That's SpaceX Dragon. Uh, we're all feeling good, just waiting on the opportunity to get out of the castle. That's all. <laughs> all right, SpaceX copies. Yeah, so the call there you heard was uh, that gives the crew some SA that uh, the recovery crew is going to be approaching because if they do hear bumps or see shadows or silhouettes moving outside the windows, you can't see, you don't have direct line of sight into the room, but you can see maybe some movement or light changes, and that lets you know that's people that's intended versus something uh, off nominal happening. And then a PMC stands for a private medical conference. Um, and as you heard, they're doing fine, just waiting uh, to get out. Yep. And so that's going to do it for our coverage of Crew-6, the first attempt of Crew-6 to launch to the International Space Station aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon Endeavor. Didn't get to do it today. Roger, you're gonna have to wait to see your first <laughs> launch. Yeah. But uh, good co good things come to those who wait. And so I wanna thank you for being here. Oh, really appreciate I appreciate it. It was, it was a fun time. I'm, I'm sure I'll get to see a launch eventually. So uh, as you mentioned, those follow on launch opportunities, uh, right now I'm sure the teams are gonna be working, continuing to work through breakfast and lunch to figure out uh, what the if they can fix the problem and, and when we'll be ready to go. But uh, we'll go when what's safe and ready to go. So Absolutely, NASA's ethos will launch when we're ready. And so that's going to wrap up our coverage for this evening. Thank you for watching Crew-6's launch attempt to the International Space Station. I'm Daryl Nail for Raja Chari and everyone at NASA. Thank you for watching and have a great morning.
We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible. With science fiction turned reality, with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? Because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close.